Good morning. Welcome to the Prada Museum in Madrid, Spain. Today we're continuing our Wednesday series of short conversations in front of just one artwork in the collection. And today we'll be looking at this exceptional crucifixion painted in the beginning of the 16th century by a somewhat enigmatic artist, Juan de Flandes, who painted in the Hispano-Flemish style. I'm Whitney Dennis with the American Friends of the Prada Museum. We're a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting the museum in as many ways as we can, alongside our sister organization, the Fundación de Amigos del Museo del Prado. Now I say that, sorry, we have a little bit of noise here. They're doing some work here in the museum. I say that Juan de Flandes is enigmatic because we know very little about his life and training. We don't actually even know his real name, which is why he's called Juan from Flanders, because that's the region that he was from. And this is one of the things that makes him an interesting artist, because he was actually very successful in his lifetime. <laughs> Sorry, we have some... <laughs> Wait, one minute. <laughs> Juan de Flandes came to Castile. He came to Spain to be the official painter of the Queen Isabel the Catholic. Flemish painters were especially popular for the meticulous detail that they obtained with the use of oil painting and the high quality of their small format works. In Spain, this style had to be adapted to the large dimensions of Spanish commissions, typically for altarpieces and churches, which results in this mix that we call the Hispano-Flemish style. This painting was probably one of the artist's very last. After the queen had died, Juan had to go find work outside the court, and he ended up in Palencia, where the bishop, who was a close confidant of the king and queen, hired Juan de Flandes to paint this in 1509, along with 10 other panels that would decorate the altarpiece of the Cathedral of Palencia, which we know had to be finished around 1519, or by 1519, coinciding with the artist's death. The dark clouds that are covering the sun and the moon and taking up so much space in the painting, tell us the exact moment that we're looking at. This is just after Jesus has died. Writers in the Bible say that dark clouds covered the sky that day from 12 to 3 o'clock. And so the emphasis on this massive and unusual foreboding cloud tells us that this is exactly the moment that we're looking at. And we can also notice that this is also right after this group of onlookers has, the, the large group of onlookers has left the scene. And the only people left really are Jesus' closest family and followers. Here on this side, we have Mary, St. John, the two Marys and Mary Magdalene that form this sort of descending pyramid shape that is echoed on the right side with the figures that represent those who have converted that decide to remain at the scene and stand in awe. We have a centurion and a horseman. The centurion still has his mouth open in amazement. And the soldier looks on at Christ as well. The diagonal lines in the soldier's arm and then the staff that comes out echo and balance out this pyramid shape, inverted triangle composition on the right side. The mood is somber and quiet and still. The figures all seem like they're isolated in their own individual experiences of grief, of awe. They seem like they're all suspended in motion. And this introspective quality is another way that Juan has managed to translate something that is characteristic of smaller format, Flemish painting, to the larger dimensions of his commissions in Spain. The underdrawing shows that there are originally more figures here, but the end result has been simplified to the most essential elements. There were uh, there was a figure here between Mary Magdalene and the two Marys. And there were two more horsemen by the centurion as well. One hallmark of Flemish painting that Juan de Flandes brings is the way that it depicts the quality of objects, meaning that a cloth, for instance, would really look like what our eye would read as a cloth in real life, when we can even imagine what it would feel like to touch if it would be silky or velvety or leathery we can notice the polished, reflective surface of the soldier's armor and compare it with these rich, heavy, velvety folds of the virgin's cloak lined with fur. And we can notice the teardrops on her face and the thick, glossy droplets of blood that fall from Christ's arms. Both have been oversized so we, can, so we can see them well, which adds to the emotional punch of this painting. And let's take a minute to look at all of these objects here in the foreground, too. 
there are a few rocks that have been scattered around to make the ground look realistic, but among the rocks are a few objects that seem a bit out of place, and their presence might seem a bit surprising, a bit puzzling. We have a skull, a femur, a pelvic bone. There are small precious stones. There's a piece of coral. All of these are here because they have a symbolic meaning. The coral, for example, represents Christ's blood. And these bones lying at the ground, which happen to be right at the bottom of this inverted triangle shape, so they really get our attention. These refer to Adam, to the first man. According to legend, Adam was buried right at this spot, right at Golgotha, was where Christ was crucified. So these bones remind us of Jesus' predecessor. Jesus was often called the second Adam. Experts have also identified the different gems that appear. We can see rubies, emeralds, smoky quartz, moonstone. These all represent paradise. And there are more precious stones throughout the painting, not just here in the foreground. We can look at the detail and the texture of the necklaces, in the headdresses. and also in the adornments on the horse's bridle. In the background, the city, which would presumably be Jerusalem, is actually the skyline of the Alhambra in Granada. And this would have been a symbol of the triumph of Christianity because King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel had just recently retaken the city. Well, I hope that everyone has enjoyed having a closer look at what Hispano-Flemish painting is in this crucifixion by Juan de Flandes, and I hope that everyone has a chance to come see it in person one day, and if you don't, then you can find out more about it on our website, and you can also see great images, close-up of all of these wonderful details. You can also go to the website of the American Friends of the Prada Museum, and also our sister organization, the, the Fundación de Amigos del Museo, del Museo del Prado, to find out more about the projects we do and how you might get involved. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you here again next Wednesday.